people ask me, what do you think about the equality of women and men and flagrant violence, horrible inequity and injustice happening in the world today? My answer is, none of it surprises me, but I'm just glad that it's news. It used to not be news. But transforming society and implementing justice is also messy business. And too often, people don't implement justice under the guise of wanting to preserve unity. And the result is that people are opting out of hard conversations because it hurts too much. We end up having to look a little bit at ourselves and that, that image in the mirror is too hard for us. So our next speaker is Lely miller Moreau. She's the founder and executive director of the Tahereh Justice Center out in DC. And she established the Tahereh Justice Center in 1997 following her involvement in a high profile case, some of you may know about, that set a national president and revolutionized asylum law in the United States. Fauzia Kasinja, a 17 year old girl who had fled Togo in fear of forced polygamous marriage and genital mutilation, was granted asylum in 1996 in the US by the Board of Immigration Appeals. This decision opened the door to gender-based persecution on the ground, as a grounds rather, for asylum. That's a big win. So using her portion of the proceeds from a book that Ms. Kazinja, am I pronouncing this correctly, Ms. Kazinja? Okay. That they both wrote together, that they co-authored about this case. It's called, Do They Hear You When You Cry? Again, the book title is called, Do They Hear You When You Cry? Lely established Tahereh. So since 2001, Lely has led Tahere in service with more than 22,000 women and children, growing to over 70 and expanding offices from Greater DC to Houston, Baltimore, and the San Francisco Bay Area. What about Chicago? Yeah. <laughs> we need less offices, right? Yes, less of that going on. Prior to joining Tahereh Justice Center as executive director, Lely was an attorney of a law firm, uh, a law firm rather, at Arnold and Porter, where she practiced international litigation and maintained a, sub, uh, a substantial, rather, pro bono practice. Prior to joining Arnold and Porter, Lely was an attorney advisor at the U.S. Department of Justice Board of Immigration Appeals. Lately is a frequent lecturer and has appealed, uh, appeared rather in numerous news outlets. She lives in the DC area with her husband and three children and she attended uh, the International Relations Program at American University for her JD and MA and Agnes Scott College for her BA. She has a slew of awards which I'm not going to read to you but Yay for those as well, right? So before Lely comes on, we're going to do a quick vid video featuring the work of the Tahereh Justice Center and please cue the video. The Tahereh Justice Center got started 20 years ago as a result of my involvement in a case when I was a law student involving a young woman from Togo, West Africa, who was fleeing female genital mutilation and a forced polygamous marriage. At that time, in 1995, our laws did not provide for refugee status for women and girls fleeing forms of persecution that were being inflicted simply because they were women. I argued her case before the immigration judge. It was appealed ultimately to the highest immigration court in the United States, where it received a good deal of media attention, and at that level, she won. And her case then set national legal precedent, opening up the doors to what we now call gender-based asylum. Some of our clients have experienced really horrific violence. They have experienced female genital mutilation or cutting. They've experienced forced marriages, domestic violence. These are forms of violence that women and girls experience more than men do simply because of their gender. Mi 
mi país de origen es Honduras. Mi pueblo es pequeño, pero no son unidos. Cada quien sale adelante con sus problemas solo. Cuando tal vez yo salía así como a bodas y había en fiestas, cosas así, él me, me trataba de sacar. Por último, um, fue cuando me secuestró. Él dijo, es que yo no quiero estar contigo, yo no quiero estar contigo, yo quiero estar con mi mamá, solo tengo 15 años. Él me rompió mi camisa y fue cuando comenzó y me violó. Ay, me, me sentí una mujer sucia. No tenía nada que ver con nadie. Pues el niño fue creciendo con, con mi mamá y conmigo. A ese señor llegó a mi casa una tarde que mi mamá no estaba. Me tumbó la puerta de la casa y llegó y me volvió a violar. Pero nunca pensé que yo iba a quedar embarazada de Daniel. Being traumatized by domestic violence, human trafficking, or other forms of gender violence can make it very hard to tell and share the details of your story. We work very hard developing a relationship with each of the women who approaches us seeking help so that she feels she can open up to us. Araceli could tell us the things that happened to her that she never told anybody else. And sometimes she could only do it in the quietest voice because she was so ashamed uh, of the things that had happened to her. And that was probably the hardest thing because she didn't ask for them. Él me golpeó y me hizo así. Yo caí sentada. Y los niños le dice, Juan, ¿y por qué le pegas a mi mami? Le dice. Fue cuando, cuando él me lo puso aquí. Y ya de aquí yo ya no me acuerdo nada. Lo que siento es algo blanco. Yo escuchaba que mi papá lloraba. Entonces vino mi papá y me dijo, Mira, hija, me, la verdad, me dijo, me duele decirte esto, me, pero te golpeó, te pegó un tiro a ti y te mató los dos niños, me dijo. Y los niños murieron. By the time our clients come to us, they are already heroes. They have already decided to leave. Some of them have traveled through deserts, over oceans. They've had to scramble together resources. They've had to navigate a system where they don't understand the law. They don't know the language and they don't know the systems. And many of them have had to do that with infants in tow, young children who are dependent on them and with absolutely no resources and with ostracism and exclusion from their families. It's incredible what they go through in order to seek justice. And it's a real privilege to be able to support them in their journey and in their courage. And so we use the law here at Tahare to help those women and kids get the kind of protection they need, what they deserve, and what they're entitled to under the law. But the complexity of the system and the inaccessibility of the system right now means that without a lawyer, you have only a 16% chance of success. 
With any lawyer, you have 47% chance of success. And with the Tahari Justice Center's legal representation, you have a 99% chance of success. En mi caso, recomendarlas a, a la organización KGB, darles mi apoyo como mujer pues que he sufrido, son casos que no me gustaría que otra madre lo pasara. Very unfortunately, we're only able right now to help one out of every 10 women and girls who call us for help. There is so much more that the Tahare Justice Center can do. Our model for providing services is efficient. We turn every dollar donated into four of impact. We're now in multiple cities throughout the United States and a national leader in public policy advocacy on behalf of immigrant women and girls. We have a long way to go before women and girls are truly protected from violence. In order for the Tahare Justice Center to protect the lives of even more courageous women and girls, we need financial resources. We need the support of donors who will come forward and help protect women and girls from violence, but also help transform society. Thank you so much. And Emily, thank you so much for your wonderful remarks. Um, I got very excited about the possibilities here in Chicago, um, not only because of the foundation's leadership, but because of all the wonderful things happening in this city. And, and you are really very lucky, I hope. You know, I was beginning to write down, as if I lived in Chicago, um, Emily had great concrete ideas for engagement, and I just hope everyone engages in, in the many avenues that you provided for engagement. And Chicago is a leader in many ways on, on many of these issues, and, um, but we all have, have so, so long to go. Um, so ac achieving the equality of women and men um, is fundamentally about the advancement of civilization. Um, yes, it's about remedying a wrong. It's about protecting vulnerable. But in addition to that, it's about helping humanity evolve, helping society advance. And we're all attached to that same outcome. We're all equally handicapped by our continued inequality and things like injustice and violence for women perpetuating um, Emily stole my favorite quote from the Baha'i writings, which um, is this quotation of the two wings of a bird, and I'm so glad that you shared it because it does illustrate this principle of um, what we mean by equality in the best sense because we're attached to the same bird and we're all flopping around on the ground together. We're all equally unable to fly. And similarly with this bird of male and female wings, they're not the same, actually. They're not identical. You can't, in fact, stick the right wing of a bird on its left side or the left wing of a bird on its right side. They're unique and distinct wings, but they've got to be equally strong, equally coordinated in order for this bird of civilization to soar and reach its fullest potential. So it's an essential issue. Our progress is dependent on it. Our evolution as a society is dependent on it. But the truth is we have made great progress. Um, you know, the stories that, that I have shared through the Tahereh Justice Center, the stories and um, wonderful work of many organizations that Emily shared, um, could leave you depressed, understandably. But I think it's also important to think optimistically about the future and to look fairly at our progress you know, over the last 100 years, 200 years, even the last 50 years. And it's clear that the trajectory is upward. <laughs> it's clear that we're moving in the right direction. Um, but it is also clear that we are so far from where we need to be. And it feels, I would argue, in, as it does in the last few weeks, the last year, that, that things don't always go in one direction completely. We backslide a little bit, then we make uh, progress. But I think also what's happening in the world today, whether it's learning about Harvey Weinstein and you know all, all, all of the things that have happened there, 
it's all good. <laughs> it's so positive that these things are coming out because they've been going on for a long time. That is not new, you know, um, and this is true for a lot of issues in the United States today. You know, when people ask me, what do you think about Harvey Weinstein? I, my answer is, none of it surprises me, but I'm just glad that it's news. It used to not be news. Um, and in particularly with that situation, it has been well known for a long time. And the fact that it is now news is a big deal. The fact that it's intolerable to people is really what's a big deal. Um, similarly, you know, when, when the riots happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, not far from where I live, um, you know, some people, I think, not that they discovered that racism was still around, but it was a shock to, to an unfortunately large number of people. And, and it's, it's not new, it's been there, and we're just now, it's in our face in a way, maybe, that it hasn't been in the past, whether it's sexism or racism or all kinds of other things. And the in-your-face part's really good, actually. It's painful, it's not easy, but it's such a blessing that we can talk directly, we can deal directly, we can feel pain acutely, which is the way we respond. We don't respond very well as a civilization if we're comfortable. I, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish that for myself. <laughs> I know that um, when I had gestational diabetes for uh, my um, second and third child, I ate so well. I, I took out sugar from my diet. I ate completely well. And I remember saying to myself, I think I even wrote it in a, like, I promise myself journal. Now that I know how to eat so well, you know, when the pregnancies are over, I'm going to keep eating like this. I didn't. <laughs> You know, or when we, when we know we need to be really good about praying and, you know, morning and night and we need to be focused on our spirituality, but there's just something about tests that make you do that in a way that absent pressure, absent discomfort, it's hard. It's hard to make ourselves do the right thing absent a little bit of pressure. And so I, I feel like that we're living at a time right now where there's a little bit of divine kick in the pants. Where if we couldn't do it on our own, because we knew, it's not that we haven't known, what justice looks like, what ending violence looks like, what equality looks like, what um, being spiritual beings looks like, what recognizing our oneness looks like. It's not that we didn't know those things, but we weren't sufficiently motivated to implement it, I think. And so now we're in this um, intense zone. We're in this moment of high motivation. People are uncomfortable. People are protesting. People are marching. People are angry. People are um, vocal. And those are all really good impulses because I have faith that they will drive us to both introspection and societal change. Um, so with regard to the equality of women and men and flagrant violence, horrible inequity and injustice, what do we do about it? And, um, you know, in addition, and, and you know, the answer is a lot of things all at once. And I would completely support um, all of the efforts that the Chicago Women's Foundation supports. I was happy to see a lot of colleagues' faces uh, up there, organizations that we work with closely. But I think that you can put efforts into two big buckets, essentially. One is a bucket of personal transformation. And that's hard stuff. That's about me and what I do that perpetuates, even with the best intentions and even unknowingly inequities. The other bucket is societal, law, policy, structures, and we need to be working on both at the same time. It's not an either or situation, it is an and situation. But I would argue, and I'm a lawyer, I like law, so don't get me wrong, but we have been for too long focused, I think, on policy and laws and institutions, and there are good reasons for that. Part of it is that it's comfortable because it's disconnected from me. 
I can work on that, and it's not really my fault, and I can righteously champion it because it's not personal to me. But it's about shifting laws and policies that need to be changed, absolutely need to be changed. But that's what we talk most loudly about. I think another reason is, is to be honest, it's easy to get funding for it because it's measurable. They're metrics. We can, we can um, you know, say how many people we've served. We can check off a box around having passed legislation. Um, it, like you can see it. You can touch it. You can feel it. It's, it's, it's measurable. Um, it's easy to look at. And you can have a celebration party afterwards. But the introspection stuff, the personal transformation stuff, that's hard to measure. You can transform someone in an anger management course and they're good for two years and they're not good again. And then they need to go back in and then they're good for a little bit and then they're not good for a little bit. You can work on sexual behavior and self-esteem issues and you can improve um, teenage pregnancy rates and then you don't improve them anymore. You're not really sure why because you're doing the same thing that you were doing before. Personal behavior attitudes, assumptions, beliefs, our values, the stuff we do behind closed doors is hard to measure, it's hard to control. And, and, but it is arguably more important because if we were spiritually transformed, if our hearts were transformed, then the laws would happen as they should because the people making them would be mindful and would have a lens of e equity and equality. And similarly, if our hearts and our souls were transformed, then we would not be um, finding loopholes in the law or trying not to get caught under the law or hoping we won't, but there would be full adherence. And <clears throat> law related to how we treat people behind closed doors has really limited capacity for impact, very limited capacity. So just to give you a few examples, um, many of you are obviously familiar that in the 1960s, there were a slew of civil rights laws passed. And then in the 70s, there continued to be many, many civil rights laws passed, fundamental civil rights laws. Most civil rights law that I rely on, other lawyers rely on, were all passed during this time frame, refined in the subsequent years. But if you did not notice or you didn't know, we have not eliminated racism. We've got good laws. And in fact, the United States is seen as a um, model for anti-racism legislation, um, for our Bill of Rights is considered model um, globally. Countries from all over the world come to study our constitution. Um, but we haven't, we haven't got this part right yet. Similarly, it has long been against the law to hit people. Long time, not new at all. And, and in terms of domestic violence, that's a little bit newer um, and, and then the implementation of it, which took a, an important case in the 1970s to make sure police were enforcing the law. But there's been a basic framework paradigm, but no one can claim they didn't know it was a crime or not legal to hit your wife. It happens anyway. It happens at incredibly, incredibly high rates. And so, you know, when it comes to behavior behind closed doors in very private spheres, when it relates to how we fundamentally view each other, how our families talk about other people at the dinner table, and how we view certain people as greater or less than, that's here. And laws don't reach that. We, it's been proven again and again and again. In 1996, as a result of Fauzia's case, because of the media attention in it. There was a law that then Senator Patricia Schroeder had been trying to pass for four years. It was a law that would make female genital mutilation if committed in the United States a felony. And according to the Centers for Disease Control, over 120,000 women and girls are at risk of female genital mutilation in the United States. And so she had been trying to get this law passed. It wasn't getting traction. Finally, with the, the media attention in Fauzia's case, the law passed. And so all of a sudden, we had this beautiful law that if it you know, wasn't clear before that this thing was bad, made female genital mutilation in the United States a felony. That's been over 20 years. We have yet to see one prosecution under it. 
and reports of female genital mutilation by girls who were undergoing it plummeted. And so it makes you wonder, is making something illegal when it has to do, when, when the person you have to report is someone you love? When the thing you're trying to transform is an aspect of your identity, a part of which you don't like, but you don't want, an, you don't want your whole culture to be indicted as a result of that one part that you're working to change you know, within your own community. And so this is complicated, and the role of the law is questionable. We are debating right now whether or not uh, forced marriage in the United States should be a crime. Um, there are um, over, uh, there, there are thousands and thousands of cases in the United States of forced marriage. We think it happens abroad, somewhere over there, but we have the same issues in the United States. Um, just as recent as two years ago, among all 50 states, not one had an absolute floor um, that was 18 on when you could get married. The Tahari Justice Center did a Freedom of Informa Information Act request in multiple states, and we found, for example, that in the last 10 years in um, Virginia, there were over 4,500, 4,500 judicially approved child marriages, as young as 12 years old. The average age differential in these marriages was 20 years older. This is in the United States. And then we found in Texas, over the last year alone, there were 4,500 child marriages, not 10 years, as in Virginia. The youngest marriage we found was 10 years old. So in the United States, okay, and our laws were designed not for parents pressuring their kids to get married, but for Romeo and Juliet scenarios. And it hadn't been examined in some states for over 80 years, over 90 years. And so Tahereh has been working state by state to try to remedy that. Um, the, the thing with child marriage as well, um, for those of you who may not be aware of this, uh, the reason 18 is important, in addition to the fact that it's a global standard, is the fact that in, um, in most states, unless you're 18, you don't have legal agency. So what that means is that if you want a divorce, you cannot hire a lawyer. What it means is that if you want to go into a domestic violence shelter, they will not take you. They will refer you to child services, and they're not set up for these kinds of cases. So there's a legal paradigm that's beyond the marriage issue itself that relates to children's rights that would have to change in order for it to be safe for anyone younger, in, given the current US legal paradigm, um, in order to marry. Because she couldn't get out. She couldn't open a bank account. She couldn't um, sign a lease. She wouldn't be, so there's a whole run on effect of why this is important, um, given the current legal paradigm in the United States. So, so the law is important, but it has these limits. And with child, um, well, child marriage is a little bit more black and white, but with forced marriage, so where somebody is facing threats of death, threats of family ostracism if they don't marry the person that their family wants them to marry. Um, we, Tahari Justiner works very hard to protect these women and girls. Sometimes we have to do identity re-engineering, so they, they go underground. Many of the families who believe their honor has been um, threatened um, believe that the only way to remedy that honor is the death of, of, of the child who's refused this marriage. And so the consequences are very severe. Um, but there is a debate right now, and the Tahari Justice Center is at the center of a consultative process where we have invited at the table South Asian Muslim communities, ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities, um, very conservative Mormon communities, homeschool Christian associations, and a wide, wide range who are all impacted by child and forced marriage to be at the table because they all view this issue differently. And we are also looking at the United Kingdom as an example because they're light years ahead of the United States. For a very long time, they've had a temporary restraining order in place specifically for forced marriage. We don't have that. Our temporary restraining orders require a very high threshold of repeated threats and abuse in order to obtain it, where if a child or a young woman goes into court and says, my parents don't hit me, I'm a straight A student, but my father has arranged for me to marry my first cousin who's 
30 years older than me, and said if I don't do it, I will be beheaded. Temporary restraining orders don't work for those scenarios, and also you, they have to be against an individual, where if an entire family is a part of the process, it's completely impotent to deal with that situation. Child Protective Services refuses to engage. We were involved in a few cases where, again, you're dealing with a situation without a pattern and practice of abuse, even where there's a very um, significant threat of life-threatening harm to that person. We were dealing with Child Protective Services on one case where the family was threatening to send them abroad. And Child Protective Services said, you know, this is not a, an issue for us because the threatened crime would happen abroad, not on US jurisdiction. And sending someone on a plane when they don't want to go on a plane itself is not a crime. So that jurisdictionally, they believed that there was nothing that could be done. We actually took it to the congressman, the US congressman in that jurisdiction, we end, who, who ended up calling the general counsel's office of child protective services. We ended up walking into court with that child during her lunch break. Her principal and her high school guidance counselor was trying to help her. She learned that her family intended to send her that Saturday to ab abroad in order to marry this first cousin. They had chained her to her bed on Tuesdays and Thursdays because they realized that Child Protective Services or the school would not be triggered if she was in school three days a week, at least. But they did not intend for her to graduate. They didn't think she needed an education. So she came to school and told her guidance counselor, the time is now. We had worked out a safety plan, and we had mobilized in order to help her when that moment came. And we all hoped it wouldn't. She hoped she could continue to talk to her family and convince them not to do it. But they did. And we had a very large law firm who prepared all kinds of legal documents, arguing when there was no law in our favor. <laughs> arguing all kinds of public policy arguments as what lawyers do when there's no actual law that you can use in your favor. We walked into court at about five o'clock at night. We had arguments until eight o'clock at night. We argued that the judge put her in our custody because we knew Child Protective Services wouldn't take care of her. We, and, and, and what the judge said was, you may have custody of her, and then looked at Child Protective Services and said, so sue us over this and let's make some law here. Because you only can make law if, if you know, controversy goes up. And what happened though was everyone saw what the right thing to do was and no one challenged it. And she ended up living underground with a board member for about six months while her family hired a lawyer and they ended up suing and trying to get her back. And we hired a guardian ad litem who spoke Arabic, who could be in the meetings. And the first meetings went something like this. All is forgiven. There's nothing wrong. Come home with us now. And we knew enough to know that that's not the case. The second meeting went something like, we wish you were dead. You're never welcome home. And you shouldn't come back ever. And then the fourth meeting was the mother alone in tears saying, I was forced to marry and I don't want the same thing for you, keep fighting. We had over 12 meetings with her parents. She's now home and she's safe. And we have her passport, they don't, there's a court protection on it and she has to check in every month to make sure she continues to be safe. But the goal was not to put her parents in jail. The goal was to transform the values and the behaviors of the family. That is what success is. And that is what will then protect her sister, who was being told she would have to marry him if, her, if she didn't. But that's, we want transformation, not just people being punished, people being deported, and people being vilified, and people being criminalized. These issues are deep, and they are all of us. And so the role of the law is tricky. There's a role for it, but it is insufficient in and of itself. And so we have to really focus on the yucky stuff. We have to focus, I think, as a larger society, maybe mostly on our attitudes, our behaviors, and our assumptions, because this is the stuff of lasting change, of true transformation, and the implementation. Uh, the likelihood of the implementation of the laws that we do work so hard to pass. 
But transforming society and implementing justice is also messy business. I think I've been a part of some very interesting conversations. In fact, just um, two days ago, I was a part of really interesting conversation around, I, I, I guess I would put it in terms of how angry we are at people who were like worse than we even thought. Even in our own families, in our own communities, different sides of people are coming out and, and we're seeing sides, we're seeing issues, we're seeing sexual harassment that shocks us, we're seeing violence that's surprising to us, we're seeing racism that's shocking to us, all of these things. And the inclination is to hate. That's the first inclination, to be angry back. It's a human, my six-year-old's really good at it. <laughs> you know, um, just, <laughs> just today, I was talking to my husband in the airport, kind of how are things going, and, um, and he said, well, we were at a soccer game today, and I told Khalil to go get his jacket, and so I went to go fold up the chair, and he lost sight of me for a minute, and he panicked, you know, six-year-olds do that, and he started crying hysterically, and then um, when Gil made himself known to him and, and gave him a big hug, said, I was right here all along, you know, um, I'm so sorry, and, he, and Khalil said, I hate you now, I hate you, and he kind of like hit his legs, and, and he's sick, so it's fine, and you know, and, 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 and Gil said, okay, I understand, you know, you're very, very, but you know, please forgive me, I'm very sorry, I didn't tell you where I was going. By the time I talked to them on the phone, they were getting burgers, and it was two hours after this incident, and on the phone, Gil said, um, Khalil, do you forgive me now? And he goes, no, I'm still mad. <laughs> and you know, you realize, okay, it'll take like till tonight, and then he'll, he'll be okay. But we're all in that six-year-old, no, I'm still mad phase, I think. <laughs> There's a real sense of no matter what your intention was, no matter what actually happened, there's there's a lot of anger and um, and there's a lot of, of, of demonizing the demons and otherizing people who are otherizing other people and labeling people who are labeling other people. And that's that and, and there's a lot of self-protectionism, some of which is really reinforced and supported from best friends to even therapeutic professionals. This idea that you know, we shouldn't have to be uncomfortable. If someone's making you uncomfortable, create a boundary. If something is stressful for you, you know, just surround yourself with positive energy. Don't do that. Don't talk to that person. And the result is that we're not staying in the room with each other. And that people are opting out of hard conversations because it hurts too much. We end up having to look a little bit at ourselves and that, that image in the mirror is too hard for us. We're having to look at other people who make us angry and, and to stay in that conversation, to stay in that room is proving too hard for many of us. Now, some of that is understandable and everybody is at different stages. And so depending on level of trauma, level of suffering, level of pain, level of maturity, whether you're six, whether you're 60, it, it, you, we are gonna be at different stages in our capacity to forgive our capacity to really understand where does that come from for you? And what about your worldview am I misunderstanding? And then maybe you'll be open to my worldview. That mutual dialogue is missing right now in a lot of our conversations. And it's the hardest thing to do. But the Baha'i writings call us to do that. In the Baha'i writings, there's an incredibly high threshold for forgiveness. It's like ridiculous. There's, there's, there's one quotation that I have on, pasted on our um, refrigerator um, that for any Baha'is who were in the room, you'll be familiar with it, but it basically, I'm gonna paraphrase poorly, but it says, if somebody poisons you, give them honey in return. If they hurl darts at you, heal them. If they are your enemy, make them your friend. It's high bar, it's high bar. And it relates to active oppression. And we have amazing examples in Abdu'l-Baha and in others who suffered repeated year long levels of persecution and, and ill treatment by specific individuals or whole groups of people and still forgave and still always made themselves available for that moment when that person might be willing 
to learn or to dialogue, and that's really hard. And the thing about justice from a Baha'i context is we have this amazingly brilliant duality in the Baha'i faith. It's that as individuals, we may not hold grudges. We must forgive. We have to have mercy on other people, and we shouldn't leave the room. We should continue to engage. We should return honey for poison. That's the standard, individual to individual. But then there's a different thing going on, and that's society's role, which is different than the individual role, and society's role is to implement justice. And this is a beautiful separation. In contrast, in Brazil, a domestic violence victim who suffers at the hands of her husband is in complete control of whether or not her case is prosecuted. And she has to, in a court system that takes on average 10 years to prosecute a case, she has to continue to be the champion and the pseudo prosecutor in the case. And if at any time she decides to drop the charges, the case goes away. Brazil has a 3% conviction rate in domestic violence cases. In the United States, we have what I would argue is a more Baha'i um, kind of principled system of justice. And basically what it says is as an individual, you are free to forgive. As an individual who's, who is in a domestic violence situation, who has to have an ongoing relationship with this person because you actually want your kids to have a father. You can do that. You can heal that relationship if you want. But if you come to me as a prosecutor and say, you know what, I've forgiven, I'm over it. He's promised he'll never do it again, and I'm okay with that. My answer is, I'm so happy for you, but I don't care. Because I work for the state, I don't work for you. And the state has an interest, society has an interest in people not beating each other up. And you may think he'll never do it again, and that's fine, I don't have to argue that with you. But statistically, he probably will. And so society has an interest that trumps the individual's interest, and it separates it from. So the individual can forgive and forget. It's not her job to hold a grudge. It's not her job to implement justice. It is the job, however, of institutions within society to do that and to do it swiftly, to do it unequivocally, and to do it it, both as a, as a, in response to the crime, but also as an example to the rest of society. And so we have different mechanisms with, with local houses of justice and also the law, um, but it's an institutional job to implement justice. And this is very clear in the writings, and it also takes care of what appears to be an internal dilemma. Am I justice or am I forgiveness? And in the Baha'i writings, as an individual, you're forgiveness. There's actually no controversy around that. But if you're affiliated with an institution, or if an institution needs to know about it, to deal with it, then that's your role, is to make sure that the institution is dealing with it. But, but in order to deal with all of these issues, it, there's this, this beautiful separation, these different paths of transformation that are distinct and unique and different that deal with the individual and deal with society. And it also reconciles religions in the past. Christianity turned the other cheek, Judaism an eye for an eye. These concepts are now reconciled and merged and not seen as in conflict with one another. So we have so much to do. We have to transform ourselves individually. We have to transform society. We have to implement justice. We have to forgive and have mercy as individuals. And we have to be merciless, however, in our implementation of justice and in our seeking justice, not in a personal grudge way, but in an institutional implementation way. And those are two very, very different things. And, um, and then ultimately, the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity, is what the Baha'i writings say. And I asked a friend who speaks Persian to help me understand this word appearance in its original, because in English, it can kind of mean two things. It can mean facade, like you just appear to be, but you're not really. Or it can mean the emergence of something. It apparently, and, and for any of you who are Persian, feel free to speak up, but what I was told is that it's a, it's a distinct word. 
And there are two separate words for these. In English, it's merged. But in, in, in um, Persian or Farsi, and this word meant the emergence, the appearance, the growth and the becoming of something. So we, it, that's what justice does. It creates unity, not the other way around. And too often, people don't implement justice under the guise of wanting to preserve unity. But we know it's the opposite. But it's messy, it hurts, justice hurts a little bit. It's, it's, it's a process of growth and pain. But the long-term benefit is true unity. And so if we really understood that, we would welcome that hard work and that journey. Um, so I'm going to, to close just with the idea that this hard work is really good for us. And maybe I'll say something about that on the panel because our, my time is over and I'm gonna stop. <laughs> so, okay, thank you so much.